Hello, it's George Anderson here, and I am joined today by a nutritional and lifestyle evolutionary anthropologist and author of Deadly Harvest, Jeff Bond. So, <laughs> hey Jeff, how are you doing? <laughs> Hello there, uh, George. <laughs> did, did I get that right? You did. You did, you did pretty well there. Right? So a bit of a mouth. Basically, basically, um, evolutionary and uh, anthropologist. We're looking at how we used to live, and uh, you know, kind of going going way back to the the Paleolithic era, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. That that kind of sums it up, I guess, doesn't it? So what your area of yeah. Is. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background. Um, you know, when I was a kid, and we went to the zoo. You would see signs in front of the cages, and they said, please don't feed the animals. And you kind of know that if you feed a gorilla on popcorn, it gets sick and dies. And the zookeeper knows there's a particular feeding pattern for each of the species. And yet, and even his children probably know that if you put a cat, a canary, and bird seed in a cage, the cat will eat the canary and not the bird seed. And yet, we used to have the idea that human beings could eat anything. And uh, I spent, uh, you know, I was brought up as a vegetarian, which was regarded as a bit of a cranky thing to be back in those days. But it, my parents and grandparents had, was part of this kind of movement that thought that this was a clean way of living. But they didn't have a particularly good uh, rationale for it. Uh, and I was uh, looking for a rationale. Uh, and, but the re reality is that nobody really had any idea what the right feeding pattern for the human species was. Uh, until much more recently, and confirmation came through just in the 1980s by the study of genetics, when we understood that everybody on this planet is descended from a small group of people who lived just 2,000 generations ago, as you say, uh, in the savannas of East Africa, just uh, 60,000 years ago. And that we, most importantly, we still have the same digestive systems, the same biochemistry, the same mentalities as for life back then. Uh, and that uh, the, the way that the human feeding pattern is the one that those people were adapted to back then. Now, since, as you say, this was the Paleolithic era, um, this has subsequently become called the Paleo lifestyle, the Paleo diet, uh, which is a pretty good shorthand. I, I originally called this the Savannah model, I called it natural eating, but bit by bit this has all become... Um, the word paleo has come to take over. And of course, all this is very new. But the bottom line is, hey, yes, the paleo diet, the paleo lifestyle is the right pattern for human beings and none other. And that's the, so this is the, it is the Bible. It is the actual answer as to how humans should be feeding themselves. Well, that's great. I mean, actually, that, that answers one of my first questions, which is why should, um, why should I care? Why should anybody who watches this, why should anybody care what we did 60,000 years ago? And uh, so really what you're saying is that this is, this is our genetic blueprint, that this is how we should be, be eating and living to many, and we're going to cover that, touch on that as well today in this short video, about how we should be uh, living our lives, um, both in terms of society and uh, you know, some of the other aspects. And, uh, and we can, we've gone through all these generations and we've kind of come away from this natural point, and now we're looking at a way of getting back and getting closer to it. And, and the answer, as you said, lies in, in our genetic blueprint. Well, this is it, and um, if you like, the mismatch between the way we live today and the way nature intended, so to speak, is now a huge problem for our, for, for, for our health in particular, for our lifespans, and, and for our mental health. And so, yes, it's a vast topic, but it is a wonderfully uh, liberating experience that once you understand this, and once you understand where we need to be going, then you can actually take control of this for your life, for your, in your own life and, uh, and steer yourself into, into the way that your body recognizes and the way your brain recognizes. And that way you, you live a much better life. Okay, well, one of the things I really want to get out today is um, a, a handful of some specific things that people can do to actually start making some changes to, to going back towards this, this, uh, this old model. I mean, in the context of modern life as well, because you know, we can't just start wearing loincloths and start running around hunting saber-toothed tigers. So we're going to look at it in the context of modern life. But before that, I, I just want to talk to you briefly about what, what a paleo lifestyle looks like. I mean, what, what is it? Because I, th I think that the, the struggle I have with it and the struggle a lot of people have with it, with it, with this notion, is that modern life is so vastly different. We have so many... Uh, shortcuts, things to do, you know, things we don't have to do anymore that don't require, you know, things that used to require effort now don't require any effort. And uh, we, we have no, 
we've come from a, a, a however many generations of scarcity, and now we have abundance. So what does a, a modern paleo lifestyle look like? What is it, in, a, in essence? <laughs> well, uh, I think you, you, this is a very big subject. Now, of course, we're looking at diets, yes, what are you eating and drinking. And we're looking at other aspects of lifestyle, like how do you sleep, uh, like how, you know, after all, these people lived an outdoor life, you know, is, is our sunshine's an important aspect. And, of course, physical activity. They, there's a paleolithic pattern of physical activity that is right for us, a paleolithic pattern of, of sunshine, uh, sleeping patterns, and, and of course, of, uh, of diet. And I think you just have to, uh, plus all sorts of other lifestyle aspects. Um, now, uh, and I think you just have to break this down and just take them one by one. Uh, I often um, do talk about the outdoor life. After all, we're all designed to live outdoors and be in the sunshine. We now know that absence of sunshine is a tremendous problem, a tremendous factor in a lot of health problems today. Um, we all know about the absence of physical activity, which our body expects to be there, and if it isn't there, things go wrong, uh, and ditto with all the other things. But if we just look at uh, what people were eating, one of the, th and this is, this is where I sometimes say to people, hey, you just have to sometimes confront your preconceived ideas. I said I was brought up as a vegetarian, uh, and bit by bit, as the evidence thumped into place, I had to grudgingly accept that human beings weren't designed to be vegetarians. Okay. Uh, that in fact, foragers uh, all through the, the, the whole eons of human prehistory, human beings were eating animals of various kinds, animal matter of various kinds, I use a very vague term, and some 25% by weight of what they were eating would have been animal matter, and the other 75% of it would be plant food of a, of a particular plant kind. And, and I suppose that's the very first lesson that we need to be um, saying is that yes, it's animal matter of a particular kind is, is, is absolutely right and essential, and so is large volumes of plant food of a particular kind absolutely right and essential. Now, once we start getting down into a little bit of the detail, the plant food, the big thing, and I think this is the very first lesson that people can take away with them, is that the plant food was what we call low glycemic. Yes, human beings are di designed for a low glycemic diet, one which doesn't give you sharp blood sugar spikes and consequent sharp insulin spikes. Um, and that means a diet which doesn't have starches and which doesn't have sugars in it. Broadly speaking, you know, that's uh, that's uh, and that's uh, so that's the very first thing, and that means, of course, that has in, I mean, it's easily said, but that has huge consequences because as soon as you start saying that, then you say, well, that's the grains and all the things that you make from grains, all the cereals, the red, the rice, the wheat, the barley, and all the rest of it are actually not human feed, food, and I sometimes laughingly call them bird seed. Uh, that's why we would be eating canaries rather than bird seeds, just like the cat. Um, but uh, yeah, that means that basically these items are not human food and we should not be eating them. And in all their various guises, the pastas, the breakfast cereals, uh, and so forth. <clears throat> uh, and other starch sources of starches, classically potato, that too is uh, uh, problematic. It's not proper human food. And in fact, right up until Shakespeare's time, it was regarded as pig food used for fattening pigs, of all things. Well, yes, it fattens human beings too, and it makes them sick. So that's the first lesson, is that the low glycemic diet is right for human beings, and that grains and potatoes and other starchy vegetables are not right for human beings. Let's talk about lifestyle briefly as well, Jeff, because I know that you're a big advocate of the notion that we, we're designed, genetically we're designed, and we would have spent long times in, in clans, in, in groups, uh, mm -hmm. With that, with families, and those connections would have been, would have been there. Um, what else can you tell us about lifestyle and um, some of the again some of the changes that uh, perhaps have happened and how we can maybe start moving back towards um, what is better for our health and our psyche, mental health, and physical health. Well, now this is um, yes, it's a very interesting subject and also quite a, a sensitive subject. When you imagine that uh, people back then were living in forager bands of about 40 to 50 people, 10 or 12 families, and they would have a territory which was theirs. And they would defend that territory against neighboring bands, uh, and sometimes they would try and 
invade somebody else's territory if there was something interesting on the other side. Um, but the, the, this forager band is the sort of natural size, if you like, of a human group. Um, uh, uh, they would, uh, and, and this leads to the notion of in-group and out-group. They were the in-group. Your forager band was the in-group. You were loyal to them. You didn't do, do them down. Um, you didn't cheat on them. You didn't lie to them. Uh, but you could do what you liked to, to somebody from one of the other groups. Uh, and of course, in a, in a kind of bigger way, you can see that this is how the Ten Commandments came out, I mean, um, which was designed basically for the Jewish tribe. Uh, and they thought it was perfect. It, amongst the first commandments was thou shalt not kill. But as soon as they, Moses came down from the mount, with uh, thou shalt not kill on one of the tablets, he gave God gave the orders to go out nevertheless and kill the Amalekites and carry off the children and, and rape the wives and all this. So it, this was still part of the notion that um, that uh, you you have your your clan, which would only be 40 to 50 people, uh, and they and they, you were loyal to them. Uh, and the big challenge today, and and I think it's remarkable is that we manage to socialize children and it has to be a process of socialization where they come to recognize that um, uh, that that you that almost anybody can be considered part of the in-group um, and that you can't just do down or lie to anybody else who is not part of your clan on the other hand what we do have is atomization of the clan we now are all, we're, we're atomized down to just a family, what was the nuclear family, a husband, wife, and two children, and now even that's split up down to often a single mum with, with one child. And that is, um, if you like, uh, uh, in purely evolutionary terms, something which is, to which human beings are not naturally adapted. Um, and of course, uh, what happens is then that you find that Governments have to take over that process of providing the what what, the, what a clan would have provided the support systems and all the rest. So this is a very big question, politically sensitive, of course, um, uh, but one which, nevertheless, when we get back to it, when we talk about uh, people who are be better in their skins, they're, they're 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 better adjusted. Part of it is because they feel part of a group. Of, which is self-supporting. It might be family, it, all being well it is, but otherwise it can be other kinds of groups. It can be sort of classically it's, it's churches, it's, uh, it's various kinds of religious groupings, it can be club societies, it can be all kinds of groups, which nevertheless where they feel part of. In other words, they're not totally alone. So yes, this is, a, this is a, an aspect which, um, which, is, uh, which is important to, as a part of human existence, that you feel part of a group where you, you can trust the people around you, that you don't have to watch your back for those people around you. And, you and, might and, not well, that's be something mistrusting that, other people. Yeah. That, that is something that is, you know, we're all capable of achieving. We're all capable of making, mm. you know, taking action to, to move back that way. Do you, and do you think that we all, whether we're conscious of it or not, we have our set point here and we've, we're over here at the moment. And we've always got, you know, the more we try and stay over here, the more we're drawn over back to this set point, which is this evolutionary idea of, of this unit, this 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 band, uh, this small close knit group that we can that we can trust, and we're over here and um, you know, trying to move back, and that that draw <laughs> is is quite stressful in some way. Well, of course, understand. because we're having to make uh, in a certain being able to operate in accordance with just what comes naturally without thinking reflexes. We're having to constantly monitor ourselves and discipline ourselves to behave in, in socially acceptable ways. Uh, but the of course the big the big challenge is that we're now in a world where we can't go back. <laughs> we, we now, we're not forager bands uh, with 200 square miles per forager band to live in, with, one, with a population density of one per square mile. We're now hundreds of millions in the country uh, and we've got to industrialize every single process of keeping ourselves alive. It's clearly food production and uh, all the rest of it that goes with it. Uh, it, it so we, we, we're now in this machine, whether we like it or not. Uh, we've got a tiger by the tail. Uh, and uh, what, we, so all we, what we can do is try and get control of it for ourselves because the machine itself is, 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 
it just grinds on, you know, and it chews us up, spits us out at the other end if we're not careful. But what we can do if, uh, is, is have to take control of it, as much of it as we can for ourselves, by a little bit of life, uh, life that we can. And, you know, this is, uh, you can do this in all various kinds of ways, but it's tough. I, I, you know, I fully agree. But once you understand that what's going on, then you can look at your own particular lifestyle and think about ways in which you can try and adjust you uh, and make decisions which make these things easier for yourself. Yeah, I, th I think that's the key point, Jeff, for me anyway, is, is looking at thinking and being aware of it and, and understanding what, you know, we, we all may feel that draw back towards something, but not necessarily yeah. knowing why. So kind of seeing it as part of our makeup, this is what we're, how we're designed to be, how we're designed mm. to live, explains it to a, to a large extent. And that makes it perhaps easier to, to make those tough choices and to make those changes to, to start rebuilding the, the, the lifestyle that we, we perhaps no, we should. Um, one of the examples I give is the workplace. I mean, working for foragers was just going out and foraging. And they did it for three or four hours a day, and then they were done. Um, but the important point was that, first of all, it was something, it was what their life was. That was their, that was their raison d'etre. You know, that was fulfilling. So their work was fulfilling. Secondly, they only did it for three or four hours a day. They were doing it <laughs> seven days a week, probably. But they were only working 20 hours a week. Thirdly, um, it, it, they, uh, there wasn't anybody in charge of their, uh, 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 of their livelihood. They wanted to feed their family. They just got up, walked off into the bush, started collecting berries, trapping birds or whatever, and they did it. And if somebody, for some reason, fell on hard times, well, the other members of the band would help them out, uh, get them over to that temporary problem because it was always reciprocated. There was a, a strong sense of re reciprocity in, in the forager band. Um, where people would help each other out if uh, you know, somebody went for some reason hunting and it just didn't work out for three or four days in a row. Um, but uh, so, so th there was that sense of reciprocity. But, on t but in particular, there wasn't this particular machine that we're living in, which is really a product of the industrial age. We forget that this has only been around for 100 years. We actually have employers and employees and that you work for a certain set period of your lifespan until you're 60, 65, whatever it is, you work, they work you until they squeeze all the pips dry and then they chuck you out and they say, right, now go and enjoy yourself, uh, go and retire, uh, which is, again, totally unnatural way of being. Um, the, the ideal is that you have a, a, a work a, a process, if you like, of livelihood, which is fulfilling, which is not too challenging, and which you continue until you come to the end of your life because then you are still have, you're still... Uh, retain your dignity, you retain your sense of self-worth, you're still contributing. Uh, yeah, and this is a vital part of mental health as well. So, well, actually, Jeff, we've, we've, we've got quite a few things there, and some specific things that we can that we can do. And, I mean, some of them like changing, you know, we're not going to turn into foragers and just go and, uh, you know, find <laughs> our food for three or four hours a day. Not nicer that that would be, but in, in a modern context, that's not practical, as you, as you, uh, as you well know. Um, but we have do it myself. <laughs> but we have considered. We well, live in Cyprus. That's not fair. That's a bit easy. Well, I mean, this is a lifestyle choice. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, Sometimes. a lifestyle choice is to work for myself, um, not have an employer, and to live in a place which has got sunshine and palm trees. It means sacrifices. It means I can't be part of the buzz of a big city. But I regard. But I go back to a big city to get my fix. And in a way, going to big cities. It, is, is a bit like being on drugs. You're getting an unnatural fix of, of stimulation, which the average forager would only get once a year or quite a couple of times a year when they would have a, what they call a jamboree or a, when they'd have a big get-together with the other tribes, so the meeting of the tribes, and they would have a, perhaps one year, a year or so, once a year they would have this big get-together um, and have their fix. But uh, in a way, this is, this is part of a lifestyle choice. But, of course, it, it has its drawbacks because it means that you're separated to some extent from family and from other people. Um, you have to make other kinds of social connections. These things aren't easy. This is not easy in today's world. But, yes, um, in a sense, this is one of those choices that are made consciously yeah. that, um, that living in England, I am obviously an England, a Londoner indeed, um, but uh, the gloomy, long gloomy weather in the winter time is not for me, um, <laughs> and it's stop. not for any human being. You know, I sometimes say to people, "Yeah, you know, really, people shouldn't be living north of a latitude, thirty-five degrees north or south." You know. <laughs>
Uh, but there are, there are, as we've already mentioned, several uh, nutritional things, some diet choices we, we, we are capable of making. Um, yes. Hard though they may seem at first, but certainly removing uh, grains from your diet is, is a big change. And whenever I coach people nutritionally, it is the thing that make, they struggle the, the most with. Um, especially as I work with a lot of runners, and uh, runners are just so used to to having bowls of pasta and bread to fuel their their activity, and and feeling like they're very low in energy if they don't have some kind of starchy carbohydrates to fuel the the the, the intense and uh, prolonged activity that they do. Um, but it is possible to do that because you vegetables it's often disregarded that they there are fantastic source of carbohydrate and you know it's not going to give you those same spikes to blood sugar levels as you would do if you're having that bowl of pasta or a plate of table sugar so so that certainly for me what you know what people can take away from this this is one of the first things that we can do diet what diet wise to start returning back to our our natural way and as you said just increasing the amount of plant food that we consume so we've always been told that vegetables are good for us now yes. here we have this is even more yeah, evidence. Yes. <laughs> even more evidence that that is the <laughs> case. Um, so that's that's a good thing as well. And and you know, I'm always again trying to trying to encourage people to eat more veggies at every eating point in the day, not just uh, you know having a, a couple of portions of meat and two veg in the evening, but to have them all the way through the day and sneaking them in there as much as possible as well. And um, and uh, you mentioned there about the lifestyle choices as well. You know, being a part of a community, being a part of a group. And you know your family, work colleagues as well. It's something that we're it's something we're designed to do. We're designed to socialise, and that's a, that's a very important thing for our health, um, mental health as well as, uh, as physical health. I'd go as far as to, as far as to say you feel more motivated to to uh, you know to engage and to engage in physical activity when you're happy, and uh, you know it swings both ways because then when you're exercising you feel happier and more likely to want to go out there and engage socially. So. Have a well, absolutely. The physical activity is part of modulating all kinds of hormonal functions, including ones to do with mood. And uh, just to come back on the idea of carbohydrate loading and so on, um, in a sense, yes, you can use starches, which, which is what we're talking about really, isn't it? Starches and perhaps sugars uh, as a kind of a, <laughs> I suppose, a performance enhancing drug, um, uh, which is not the way it would normally have been back in forager times. Uh, on the whole, foragers didn't do endurance stuff much, um, although Lawrence van der Post, back in the 1950s, related a story of how he was with a little band of forager, uh, Sam Bushman, trying to follow them in a Land Rover across the desert, of course it was, it was bumping around and only doing about seven or eight miles an hour, but foraging as they were jogging along for 24 hours <laughs> uh, to track down a wounded antelope that they they shot with a poisoned arrow, but the thing just was kept going until they finally ran it down. And so it did happen, and it would happen from time to time that would, they would do this. But of course, they well, they weren't stuffing themselves with carbohydrates first or anything like that. They yeah. just got up and started running because that was the way it was. Um, and of course, there are uh, there is a movement now amongst pa of paleo athletes who who are now trying to uh, and are following the paleo system of, of, of eating and doing perfectly all right on it. And I certainly got one or two followers myself who are Ironman athletes who, uh, who, who are perfectly happy with the, the results they're getting following the paleo system, paleo diet, if you like. Um, uh, they certainly have to load up a lot more on, um, uh, on the fatty fish, I think, to get their calories. But, yeah. um, and as I said to them, you know, in the end, being an Ironman isn't really what the human frame is designed for. So, uh, you know, by all means, twist, if you like, the paleo diet to, to suit what, what you have to do. But understand that this isn't perhaps what, uh, you know, what, what nature intended your body to be doing. I love, your, I love your description, actually, in some of the talks that I've, uh, I've seen you give of what would happen if, uh, you know, we're designed actually to, you know, we're going to be, if we're back in the, back in the paleo day, we'd probably be a bit peckish most of the time. Um, yes, and your your explanation as to why why that is, you know, if you, you feel a bit hungry, you can't just go to the fridge and and get some coconut out. You got to get up, walk a mile, <laughs> climb a tree, knock a nut down, <laughs> and bring it back in. It's a bit more of a hassle, and uh, you know, so that's why we get so freaked out by getting hungry, and um, because yes. food is so readily available, we just have to reach out our hand and grab the nearest you know biscuit or energy bar or fix 
and uh, then we're uh, done. Well, this is, this is, this is true, and, it, and I, it's bizarre because I, I know sort of the generation where we, I was, the first part of my life, first 15 years of my life, we were on rations. So you were hungry, whether you liked it or not, but they didn't have the ration coupon to get any more. Um, where your mother had, a, had a, a lock on the larder door, and when she was preparing the meal, well, she'd get the food out and uh, get whatever your ration was ready, and then put the lock back on. Um, and, uh, and in a sense, that's, um, that's, that's how it was for foragers. You know, they, uh, there was this natural barrier to, to just feeding yourself whenever you felt like it. But the, the other side of it, which is the important side of it, is that feeling hungry uh, from time to time, and as I say, we're not talking about fasting or starving, we're just talking about feeling hungry from, until the next meal, is part of balancing up the way the hormones work in the body, in particular the insulin, glucagon axis, and various other ones too, which, which actually help to, which are all part of the healthy, keeping a healthy body and a healthy mind, sharpening mentality, cognitive reasoning, and so on. Yeah, and you know, our digestive systems equally, I, I imagine, aren't designed to be functioning 24 hours a day, or even uh, you know, 18 hours a day. You know, they need to have that break, they need to have that rest, where their you know, your stomach, tummy might be, might be growling a little bit, but uh, that's not necessarily a sign that your metabolism is all of a sudden plummeting and you're going to go into starvation mode. Mm. Uh, that doesn't happen as quickly as just a few hours, does it? It takes a no, little bit longer for that to no, kick in. No. <laughs> No, it doesn't. I mean, the reality is that foragers were eating, um, you know, weren't often actually starving. You know, they, they, they got hungry just because there was that tension between the trouble of getting the food and, 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 and feeling hungry. Uh, and so you, you had got that point where the tension was too much and they had to go off and do something. Um, so, uh, so there was never that, uh, so they were never actually going to what the extremes some people do, which is to... Uh, skip a meal or or or, or 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 starve themselves for a day, or do what the Muslims do during Ramadan, and I've done it with them when I've lived in Arabic countries, um, where you just don't eat between or drink between sunset, sunrise and sunset, yeah. and it can be really tough because when I, certainly when I was doing it, uh, well, whenever it was, twenty five years ago now, thirty years ago, this was Ramadan was right in the height of summer when when sun rose at four in the morning and, and then set again at eight o'clock at night. So yeah. you only had eight hours, if you like, of, uh, of darkness during which you could eat. And then you had 16 hours when you jolly well couldn't do anything. Now, that again, is, you know, they regarded this as a cleansing operation and it's, uh, and it's good to remind themselves of what it's like for poor people and who haven't got enough to eat and so forth. Um, but on the other hand, I still regard that as being an unnatural level of fasting. I'm not saying to people you should do things like that, particularly they're not drinking. It's, it's pretty tough. I was out in the desert, um, you know, without a drink uh, for 16 hours. That's pretty hard. Yeah. Well, there's, there's always going to be this payoff. There's always going to be this, this, this mm. balance between what we're, we're genetically designed to do and what society is going to allow us to do. I'm, I'm quite mm. sure that, you know, we're, we're probably designed to have a, a nap in the afternoon at some point, not right, right. and trying to get all our hours of sleep in one, in one batch. That's not always practical. So we have to work around this, this in some respects. But, um, I mean, what we've discussed there, I think, has been fantastic because it's given, given, uh, given us some real concrete things that we can start to do and start to think about. And, uh, and if it's inspired anybody who's watching, then obviously your book, Deadly Harvest, that's on Amazon, um, which, you know, it's a great book. And it's, it's, we, we had a, a brief conversation, didn't we, just before we, we, uh, we, we started recording this about you know, updates, it's four years old now, but really it's the Bible. There's, there's nothing else to add to it, really, because nothing's, nothing's changed, effectively. This is, this is information that's thousands and thousands of years old. Well, this is about it, really. Uh, as you may know, I do a monthly briefing as well, mm. um, which uh, answers questions and it updates, uh, it adds little bits and pieces as the news comes through. But ultimately, the basic principles are absolutely the same. And there's nothing much I would change at all in the book, as you say. Um, and it's bang up to date is the Bible, uh, paleo, eat, paleo eating, if you like, and lifestyle. Because I have a full chapter on all these other aspects to do with physical activity, sunshine, social connectedness, and all the various, um, yeah, the, all, the to, all this to do with uh, social engineering that, um, that, that we also have to try and cope with. Well, I'll get a link to that book um, on the, uh, the in information on this video, Jeff, because I think if anybody mm -hmm. does want to find out more, that is probably the place to go. I mean, you're one of the world's leading authorities on this subject, and I know that you spend a great deal of your time and have done you know, traveling the world, lecturing to groups of doctors and, and informing them of you know, the importance of, uh, you know, of a correct diet rather than the 
you know what what is conventionally accepted as as uh, what we should be eating, which is very different to what we just discussed there. So Jeff, it's been great. Um, having you join me today for this little chat, this little discussion, it's always a pleasure. And um, I'm, I'm sure we'll have some questions coming in from this video. And maybe we can record another one again at some point, uh, answering some of those specific ones. Yes, of course. Uh, I'd love to, George. I'm always happy to do that. Great. Thanks very much, then, Jeff. Bye for now. Right, thank you. Goodbye.